Thank you for joining us for the webinar on trade policy updates. My name is Victoria Cartwright, Director of Events and Education at NEFTZ, and I will be monitoring the event today. We are joined by speakers Shannon Fira and Rebecca Williams. Shannon Fira is a partner in the international trade law firm of Page Fira PC and currently serves on the NEFTZ board. Rebecca Williams is Managing Director of Rockefeller Group Foreign Trade Zone Services and currently serves as Chair of the NEFTC Board of Directors. Visit our website for their complete bios. Shannon and Rebecca will speak and then all those with questions, please type those in. Due to the mass amount of quantity of content that we have to cover today, we will be responding to those in written form and sharing with them with all those registrants. After the presentation, a copy of the present PowerPoint will be emailed to you, as well as those written responses shared. And anyone seeking CCS credit for attending the live event, please respond to my follow-up email. Shannon, you may begin when you're ready. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Victoria, and, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Victoria mentioned, we're here to talk about different trade policy actions. Uh, as everyone knows, there's been a flurry of activity with respect to, to trade policy. And so our goal today is to really talk through some of the actions uh, that have been implemented by the Trump administration and also to discuss, one, the scope of the actions, two, the effect of the actions on trade, and more specifically, the effects of the actions on the Foreign Trade Zone Program. And as part of that, we're also going to be discussing what the NASCD, as the advocate for the Foreign Trade Zone Program, has been doing to try and mitigate the, some of the negative effects uh, that are out there currently. And we're going to speak also to the things that you can do as NASCD constituents and kind of a, a call to action on input that we need from you in order to help us as the NASCD best serve you. And, and I guess to kick this off, when we talk about available trade remedies, the, the laws of the United States really are designed to provide a variety of remedies to address unfair trade practices or unfair investment practices. And there are a lot of players in the mix. We're going to talk about a lot of different government agencies, the authority um, from the, the presidential administration versus the authority of some of the agencies underlying that administration. And we're going to talk specifically about three in particular, which would be Section 201, Section 232, and Section 301. And it's important to, to reference here um, what you're going to see, in addition to a lot of players, you're going to see there are a lot of tools in the toolbox that the administration can use in order to try and combat injurious or, or unfair trade practices. And, and that's what we're seeing going on here. Historically, you certainly heard when you're when you're in our world of trade, you hear about anti-dumping, you hear about countervailing duties. You don't hear so much about the 201, the 232, and the 301. So what we want to do today, given given what is ongoing, is to talk a little bit about those and, and try to provide a little bit of clarity, if we can, to what is going on, what is currently pending, what is coming down the pike, et cetera. And for those of you who've been engaged in in the world of trade, for a long time. It's, it's a very interesting world that we live in right now. Uh, with the Trump administration, and this is regardless of anyone's political persuasion, it's an interesting world because, you know, historically when you try to explain to people what we do in the world of trade, they kind of give you the quizzical look. And now, as we like to say in our office, we're, we're the cool kids at the cocktail party. Everyone has heard tariffs. Everyone has heard China. Everyone has heard retaliation. So people have, I think, uh, at least a little bit of an inkling or a better understanding of what it is we all do. So when we look at when we look at these tools, it's important to note as we walk through them that these tools can be powerful partners in, in affecting the, the change that the administration is, is trying to affect. But what we're also going to see, if these are not these tools are not properly implemented, then they can have a significant adverse impact. And it's an adverse impact on on trade as a whole, but also an adverse impact on the foreign trade zone program. And that's something we're going to hone in on and, and specify today. The other thing that, that you'll see is that, and, and you've no doubt seen, is that the president, and this is a situation where the president has broad authority in this area. And it's, and it's important, this is now a good time before we launch in, it's important to note that given the, the level of activity that has been going on, there is actually a movement within Congress to, to limit or weaken the power of the president with respect to these types of actions. And for those of you 
who have not seen it, that there was, um, it was introduced into the House around May 10th, but it's uh, H.R. 5750, which is the State Authority Protection Act. And there's a companion bill also in the Senate. But for those of you who, who want to take a look at that, it's something to, to go take a look at. It's something that's afoot. Um, no one knows what will come of that, but it's certainly something worth monitoring as we continue to move down this road of, of trade action. And for right now, just, just to keep in mind where that is, uh, those who were referred out to the Subcommittee on Trade. Um, so again, it's important to monitor that. That's something, obviously, I think everyone is, is looking to monitor, and certainly uh, the folks at NAFTV are, are watching that as well. So as we launch in and we talk about, let's first talk about Section 201 and, and what the law is. So Section 201 is a safe car provision that effectively authorizes the president to grant temporary import relief by, by either raising import duties or imposing non-tariff barriers on goods that are entering the U.S. The idea here is to invoke the safe car provision to protect domestic industry. And these are industries that are either being seriously injured or are threatened with serious injury as a result of the surges in imports uh, that are coming into the U.S. The, the investigations where 201 is concerned are conducted by the International Trade Commission. So here's, here's one of our key players, uh, and they're based on domestic industry complaints. So the domestic, someone within the domestic industry will raise a complaint to the ITC, indicate and, and allege a threat, and the ITC will take the complaint and move forward from there. If injury or threat of injury is found based on the review, uh, the U.S. Trade Representative, USTR, will recommend responsive action to the president. And, and again, here's where we start to see that authority. The president will have final authority over the imposition of, of whatever import relief is, is going to be handed down. And the import relief, as I mentioned, can take a variety of forms, including increased tariffs, uh, tariff rate quotas, absolute quotas, import licensing fees, so those are the types of things that are at the disposal of the government to try and combat the, the injury or threat of injury. And what we're going to see is that um, any relief that is granted, so if you have the domestic and the domestic industry has issued the complaint, relief is granted, you're going to see that the, the grant is provided for up to a four-year period. So let's talk about, when you look at 201 and the law, let's talk about 201 and recent actions, and let's put it into practice. So there are two recent actions that really highlight what 201 has done. And, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the impact on the foreign trade zone program. So in January earlier this year, uh, 201 was invoked and, and the president accorded import relief to domestic producers in two areas in particular, two industries. You had solar cells and panels and washing machines. Um, and caught up in that was also both of those products key related parts. So when you look at washing machine imports, Canada and listed WTO developing countries were not covered by this. And for the solar cells and panels, only WTO developing countries uh, were exempt from this. The, the idea for this, just using the, the washing machine as an example, so for that particular industry, the idea is the big target certainly would be along the lines of a Samsung or an LG when you're talking South Korea, right? So the concern would be that the influx of those goods coming into the United States was creating um, injury to the domestics who were producing like goods in the United States. So when we turn and look at, at Section 201 specifically, and we look at the impact on FTV, so to ensure the applicability of that relief to merchandise in the FTV, there was the, the president, when they issued down the relief, they issue a presidential proclamation. And for those of you who have not seen it, they're available online. But the presidential process, and, and also I should mention as part of this, and we'll mention it a little bit later on, when these sorts of things are, are handed down by the administration or by a particular government agency, for those of you who, who are certainly members of the NAFTV, there are various e-blasts that go out. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But with respect to the e-blasts, you know, we know everyone's inboxes are certainly inundated uh, particularly nowadays with information, but it's important to take a look at those because the I know from what from a board of directors standpoint, especially the executive committee, you know they try to get the information out there quickly. If there's any um, room for comment or if there's information needed from the industry where feedback is necessary, that's where you're going to see those requests. 
So with the presidential proclamation, that was the implementing action. That was the implementing document. And it implemented the action that was required. And what it required in the proclamation is a designation of privileged foreign. So for those of you who understand status designations, it was a designation of privileged foreign status at the time of zone admission for any covered merchandise admitted. And this is important on or after, on or after the effective date. Okay. Seems like we're experiencing a little audio issue. I'll be right back with you, just catching up with Shannon. And Rebecca, you're still with us? I'm here. Okay, great. Rebecca, did you want to maybe sorry. settle? Oh, sorry. Victoria, can Shannon. you hear me okay? Yes, I hear you're back with us. Is that Shannon? Yeah, it is. I'm sorry. I have no idea why that cut off. I apologize. Okay, so, I think we're just so, back at the privileged foreign status. Yes, correct. Thank you. So for merchandise admitted in, in privileged foreign status, and, and I apologize everyone for that. You gotta love technology. For merchandise submitted in privileged foreign status prior to the effective date of the relief, it is, it is not subject to the increased tariffs or quota. This is gonna become important as we discuss the other trade remedies down the road. So the other thing to note with respect to, to section 201 is under this, this remedy, there were limited product, product exclusions that were granted under the solar cell case, but not under the washing machine case. So that's important to recognize and understand that, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about product exclusions as we get to, to section 232. And we're also going to see, one of the things we're going to see a little bit later on is also the complexity that comes into play when you start having multiple trade remedies that start being implemented on top of one another. And you're going to see um, some of the effects on that for even the domestic domestic industries who have filed complaints under, say, for example, 201, and now they may be seeing um, challenges under, say, 232. So turning, turning to Section 232. So Section 232 is invoked, uh, that's invoked in order to determine the effects of imports on national security. This is extremely important because when you look at 232 actions and you, and you look at the threat you know, again, the issue is, is national security that we're talking about. It's very different from a 201 consideration. So here, again, we have a new player. The investigations are conducted by the Bureau of Industry and Security. That's within the Department of Commerce. Um, and through what ends up happening is you have applications are submitted by interested parties. Um, there's a request from any agency or through self-initiation. So again, you have, in this situation, you have commerce, which has 270 days, again, different types of time frames, 270 days within which to report its findings. Um, relief can take a, a variety of forms, as, we, as we've noted here, in terms of increased tariffs, tariff rate quotas, or absolute quotas. So you're seeing the same type of relief that can be granted under a 232 scenario. But again, the rationale behind this is very different. And with the 232 cases that we're going to see in a minute and talk about, there is some question as to whether or not the, the national security is a legitimate basis um, to pursue what is, is currently being pursued by, by the Trump administration. So when you're looking at a 232 action, given that we're talking national security, you also have negotiations that can occur at a country level. So, so depending on who the US is, is trying to target with the concern over the threat of national security, um, you have other countries that can work with the U.S. in either to try to obtain an exemption or maybe they agree or work with the U.S. to achieve a compromise with respect to, uh, with respect to the relief that is, is going to be granted. And, and that becomes important because they, another country may look at this and say, okay, well, we see what the U.S. administration is going to do. We see what's coming down the pike. 
we think, you know, we don't want to go down that road. We don't want to be caught up in that. So let's see if we can reach a compromise so that we can com come in either under whatever that percentage is or, or some other compromise that we can reach with, with the administration. The other thing that's different about the, the situation with 232 is the fact that any relief that is granted is, is open-ended until the threat is deemed to no longer exist. So this is, again, very different than what we see in the 201 world, where you have specific time parameters uh, that can be engaged in um, in order for, for the relief itself. And, and one thing I should mention, um, just to, to step back for one moment, when we talk about the end of relief, when we were talking about 201, for the solar panels and the, the, uh, the solar cells in the panels, you had a declining four-year period. Remember, I indicated that it could be for up to four years. So it was a declining four-year period. With respect to the washing machines, you had a three-year plus one-day basis. So that's in your, your materials. It's just important to note in terms of, of the time period that's, that's under discussion. So as we look to 232 and we look to recent actions, there, there are three actions that have been initiated by the Trump administration under 232 within the past two years. So one of the things, obviously, the, the most prevalent one that we're going to talk about for purposes of today is we're going to talk about steel and aluminum. Um, there's also one that is currently pending with respect to autos and automotive parts. And as you may have just recently seen, there was a 232 investigation that is now being launched on uranium. That was just initiated. So um, both the uranium case and the auto and automotive parts actions are still under review. Uh, it's important to note that we don't know whether those will ultimately result in an affirmative finding, but it's something that everyone certainly needs to keep an eye on. And I wanna just take a moment to talk about the auto and automotive parts. So the administration launched, there was a, a notice that was issued on May 23rd which commenced the Trump administration's Section 232 National Security Investigation into this area. And it's important to note, again, this is national security based. And the target for this is uh, automobiles, including cars, SUVs, vans, light trucks, and automotive parts. And what's important about this is the allegation that's been made based on a press release by Commerce Secretary Ross is that the, the erosion of the domestic industry over a extended period of time. So that was in a May 23rd press release issued by the Commerce Secretary. That's the allegation that is being currently looked at. As part of the investigation, hearings were held, um, public hearings were held on July 19th. That is something that the NASPZ participated in, which we'll discuss a little bit later in the game. But everyone who is involved in this and engaged in this industry should be monitoring this very closely. I know this is something that we as an association are certainly doing, but you should be monitoring this closely because one of the concerns also becomes how will this be carved out? If it moves forward, what constitutes an automotive part? Um, obviously, when you look at the tariff schedule, and again, not to go too far down this road, but when you look at the tariff schedule, there are certainly provisions that are specified and broken out for automotive purposes. There are others that, um, items that certainly may be used for multiple purposes, including autos, so they're not specifically pulled out. An example would be like something like an electric motor. So just bear that in mind that that's something you certainly should pay attention to. Um, and then we'll, and, and obviously any updates, we'll make sure that uh, those are sent out to, to our, our constituents and, and members. So looking at the steel and aluminum case, that's been in effect since March 23rd, 23rd, and there are a wide range of repercussions with respect to that. So let's turn and look specifically at steel and aluminum. So the steel and aluminum action resulted in uh, the imposition of duties of 25% and 10% respectively. And this was targeted against global imports of a specific range of tariff-associated products. So it's important to recognize that when these actions are pursued, understanding the, the tariff classifications of the particular items becomes particularly relevant. There were several countries, as I'm sure you've seen, um, Argentina, Brazil, and South Korea, to name them, chose to negotiate. We talked about countries could negotiate specifically with the administration. They chose to negotiate absolute quotas, um, steel for all three of them, and aluminum also for purposes of Argentina, rather than 
go down the road of moving forward and get caught up in the larger scheme of all the other countries that were being targeted. One country, Australia, uh, remains exempt at this time, but all other countries are, are currently subject to this action. And what's important is to recognize with the complexity of these actions, they really cannot be viewed in a silo. There's a far-reaching impact that may be felt far beyond the specific industry that is originally being targeted. And this is an example of this, and I alluded to it earlier, but when we talk specifically about, remember we talked about 201, and you had a domestic industry that was seeking relief because they were concerned about injury uh, that was the harm that was coming to them based on competition from overseas and vast amounts of imports coming into the U.S. that was causing harm to them. Well, this is a situation where we've seen examples and it's been in the news. And for those of you who have not seen some of the articles that have been out there, there have been articles released um, earlier this week that talk a little bit about that, where you have domestic industry that says, this is great, we were granted relief under 201, this is exactly what we wanted to have happen to help our industry, but now they're facing challenges because they didn't know that the, the Trump administration was gonna have steel and aluminum T32 actions coming down the pipe. So what they're finding is, while they have relief, relief on the one hand, they're getting challenged on the other hand because the cost of their raw materials has completely skyrocketed because of the fact they need to import steel and aluminum to make the particular item that's, that's the item that they're making for, for the market. So it's, it's understanding that there are cascading effects. So depending on the industry that you're in, it's, and we're going to talk a little bit, and you'll see it a little bit later, you really need to keep a scorecard and you really need to keep a matrix uh, to understand what impact it may be good for you on one hand, but is it going to cause more harm for us on the other hand if there's this other action coming down the pipe. And it's, it's making sure you use your associations. It's, it's making sure you use your um, folks internally who are in your various departments, whether it's sourcing, whether it's business planning, whether it's sales, whoever, whatever the case may be, your trade compliance functions and, and your lobbying arms, if you have those in particular, really need to be working together to understand the full scope of these, these trade remedies and what the impact is going to be to your business. And it's also making sure you engage them to understand the footprint of your operation. So one of the things that I, that I really haven't mentioned, and we're not going to be able to talk about on this call, but it's something important, is the understanding of retaliation. And, and as everyone has certainly seen, and we'll definitely talk about it with respect to 301, but when our administration makes these moves, other countries are going to respond. And we've certainly seen the tit for tat that has come about with respect to other countries coming back and saying, this is not appropriate, then we're going to target you back and we're going to hit you in these industries that are going to, that we feel are going to hurt your, your economy because of what you're doing with respect to the actions against us. So from a zone perspective, when we turn to, to steel and aluminum on the next slide, when we look specifically at the presidential proclamation that was handed down and you'll look and you'll see that, the pres and again, these are all available on the USPR website, but the presidential proclamation really mimics the Section 201 proclamation by imposing the obligation to admit all covered merchandise under privileged foreign status. And again, it's privileged foreign status at the time of zone admission, and it's for any merchandise admitted on or after the effective date. And what's important about this, and we've included specific language here in your materials for you to see, but aluminum or steel articles that are manufactured in a foreign trade zone do not become subject to 232 tariffs upon zone withdrawal simply as a result of, of production. And we've included, we've included that language so you can see that. What's really troubling is this next bullet point. Unlike 201, the directive that was handed down by the administration also imposed Section 232 tariffs on all merchandise that had been admitted in privileged foreign status prior to the effective date of the action. And, and we'll refer to that just for convenience purposes as a reach back provision. This, this is extremely troublesome and caught a lot of people off guard because the intent of the administration to include this language was not publicized prior to its, its final decision. And at least to date in all the discussions that certainly we've heard, um, and, and I'll let Rebecca you know, certainly comment on this, this later, there's been no willingness shown 
to modify that direction. So that is something that people really need to keep in mind. That's something, again, that caught people by surprise. So what happens if you're heavy in one of these industries and you happen to have stocked up on products, say you happen to, to stock up on aluminum products um, in anticipation of production and you had that sitting in inventory and then suddenly this gets handed down, what happens then? This, this is something that is, is obviously very concerning. There's, there's not um, any movement on this and it's something that people need to make sure is understood throughout, throughout your company. So when you're, looking, when you're looking at the imposition of the steel and aluminum, what options do we really have? So, so the only options you really have with respect to 332, turning to the next page, is that the, the only means to really address this is to seek individual product exclusions. I'm sure, I'm sure everyone has heard product exclusion being talked about in the news, product exclusion being talked about within your companies. But the product exclusion process that has been put out there is, is based specifically on identified products, identified tariff classification, source of supply, and quantity. And there's exclusion criteria that has been publicized that a product exclusion itself, when, when the government is evaluating the exclusions that are submitted, the idea is that an exclusion will be granted if the article is not produced in the U.S. in a sufficient and reasonably available amount of satisfactory quality or if there's specific national concern security consideration warranting an exclusion. So that becomes important. So when you're looking at potentially submitting a product exclusion, you need to understand whether or not that's something that could be produced in the United States. Is it something that could be produced in sufficient capacity? Will it meet satisfactory quality standards? The quality standards are not insignificant. That's something that we've seen come up a lot recently with the exclusions that have come across the board. It, it's not just whether or not the domestic industry can produce it, but is it, it, can it be produced in the sufficient quantity and quality standards? So when you're looking at the exclusion itself, the review process, um, again, is submitted through the Department of Commerce. Um, once the request is posted, there's a 30-day comment period. So if you as a company decide that you're gonna submit an exclusion, there's a, a, a form that gets in, input that you, you submit to the government, once you submit the form, that's reviewed, and then it's posted. Once it's posted, that 30-day comment period kicks off. At that point, anyone can come back, obviously, and, and post the comment back and, and object, or, or, uh, object or provide additional comments to what has been provided. There has been a lot of exclusion requests that have been submitted and a lot of comments filed. So you'll see the as of at least as of yesterday, there were approximately, and I use approximately because the way if you go on for the cases on DIS website, you have a lot of comments, you have a lot of grants, but some of them are just straight comments as opposed to um, actual objections that have been raised. So as of yesterday, approximately 2,500 aluminum related comments were filed along with um, 21,000, a little bit over 21,000 steel related comments. What's important is out of that, it's been an overwhelming process in fairness to the agencies. Um, this had to be rolled out very quickly. They obviously had to, to come up with staffing for purposes of this, but the exclusion process itself, exclusions have been granted, but that number is relatively low given the volume of submissions that have been made. So there's been much made in the press, um, particularly with respect to uh, associations or, or the conferences that have been held where you've had a member of, of DIS at the assistant secretary level, or certainly um, Secretary Ross at the top level for commerce, where they have alluded to the fact that exclusions have been granted. But again, if you look at what has been reported in the news and what has been reported from the BIS website, that number is still relatively low. And this is causing a lot of concern. There's been a lot of concern raised within Congress as to the process, the process is going through, whether the process is efficient, whether the process is, is being looked at the way it needs to be looked at. Um, there's been concern raised by people who have filed the exclusions that the domestic, the domestic industry is not um, meeting their burden of showing that they can meet capacity. So you're seeing a lot of discussion on both sides um, of the coin. And, and it was interesting, there was an article uh, that was published where there was a quote from 
from Secretary Ross, and one of the things that he indicated uh, was with respect to the process itself, where he was he was defending the exclusion process, and he had indicated that if comments are if, if everything is in order and there is no objection that's been raised and there's no national security other national security consideration that's out there, then the agency will generally grant the request. Well, the question obviously that would would come from that is well, what does generally mean? Um, and what would be the basis otherwise in order to deny it. But, but setting that aside, there, is, uh, there are discussions that are being had regarding the process. The other problem is the fact that any exclusion that is being granted is only being granted for a 12 month period. And after that 12 month period, either a renewal must be submitted or an alternate source of domestic supply must be identified. And what, what's happening, given that the fact that this process is, is taking a, a significant amount of time and there's some backlog, the concern is by the time we get to that 12 month period, you know, you're already in, the, in a situation where you're having to submit a renewal or, or make that identification of an alternate source. So the other thing to mention is the exclusions themselves, themselves are effective five days after the decision has been posted. So that's something, that's something to bear in mind. And the exclusions are retroactive to the date the request was posted for public comment. So that's something else that's, that's important to note when you're looking at if an exclusion is granted, what can we be looking at in terms of the time frame when you take that information back to your internal folks. So, so turning from turning from uh, 232 and moving on to, to section 301. So this is not that 232 isn't fun, but this is where the, the fun really begins. So another tool that we have is, is Section 301. And again, different from 232, Section 301 is invoked to enforce trade agreements, resolve trade disputes, and, and open really open up the doors um, to U.S. goods in foreign markets. Um, and, and the concern here, and, and certainly the target, has been and continues to be China. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But investigations here, again, are conducted by another player. USTR has been a player all along, but here the investigations are conducted by USTR. If a violation is found, USTR makes a recommendation to the president, who again, this is where we talk about authority, has the final authority over the action to be taken. And the most likely action that you have in a 301 case is the imposition of tariffs. Uh, and again, it's and it's supposed to be in the amount equivalent to the, the damage that's being caused, right, to, to the U.S. or to the particular U.S. interest, which, which is being looked at as a result of the unfair practice. This particular bullet point has really come up. Um, you've seen a lot of discussions surrounding this as well, because as we'll see from the percentages that have been pulled out and implemented under 301, there, there obviously is concern raised as to, well, where did that percentage come from and, and how was that? How is that measured um, to determine that percentage? Because again, the idea is that it's supposed to look at the amount equivalent to the damage that's been caused to the particular U.S. interest. So any relief that's granted under a 301 setting remains in effect until such time as the practice has been changed. So it is it, it's kind of until perpetuity until until the particular unfair trade practice has been remedied. Um, satisfactory to to the administration and so when you look at that that's also very different in terms of the timing than some of the other trade actions uh, that we've talked about so when we look at look at 301 and we look at the recent actions in in march of of this year the the trump administration accepted findings of the USTR, and again we talk about focus on china that china has pursued unfair trade practices and a lot of this is really focused on the China Made in China 2025 industrial plan. And that's where really all of this is, is, is coming up. And the allegations are that, that China's practices um, allegedly include foreign ownership restrictions, expropriation of intellectual property, Chinese acquisitions of US technology and computer hacking. We've all certainly seen it in the news. And, and this is what really is front and center of the administration and at the heart of the administration's actions. And what the administration, we've kind of given the, the specific quote, what the administration has said is, is with respect to unfair trade practices on the acts, policies, and practices relating to technology transfer, intellectual property, and innovation. So based on the acceptance of the findings from the USTR, 
the Trump administration targeted 50 billion in Chinese origin imports associated with approximately um, a little over 1,300 tariffs, eight-digit tariff uh, classifications that were ta that were targeted. And the idea is the U.S. wanted to retaliate, and the U.S. identified retaliatory tariffs in the amount of 25 percent. And as I mentioned, in establishing that tariff list, the U.S. really tried to focus on those industries that that would most likely hamper China's in industrial plans. So when that proposed list of, of 1,333 tariff items came up, what did we really end up with? So when we turn and look, while the initial list was, was 1,333, the final list that ended up being released by the USTR only included 818 of those items. But when that final list was implemented, as you'll see on the next slide, there was an additional 284 new tariff items that were also identified along with it. And because those additional 284 provisions had not been subject to public comment, the US, uh, USTR proceeded to go ahead and implement, and this is where we start getting into list one, list two, they decided to proceed to implement list one, which encompassed the 818 and carry over tariff provisions, and they established list two for public review, which would pick up those other 284. However, and again, here's where we talk about retaliation and, and the response from China. The, the expectation that China would not retaliate was obviously, I think, pretty low from, from everyone. But China went ahead, and as the U.S. was looking at list two, China went ahead and proceeded to take retaliatory action on the original 818. So once China took that retaliatory action, that in turn prompted the Trump administration to target an additional 6,000 um, eight-digit tariff numbers. That, instead of being equivalent to the 50 billion, that was now equivalent to 200 billion. And the Trump administration imposed an additional 10% punitive tariff on, on those tariff classifications. So one of the things that, that you'll see is, is every day, for, for those of you who are trying to monitor this and trying to keep a, the scorecard, every day results in a new challenge, right? Every day we need to look to see what has been tweeted, what is the administration going to do, what is the countries we're targeting, whether it's China, whether it's the EU, whether it's Canada, um, or other countries that are, are trying to fight back on this, is how are they responding? So when we look at, at this additional targeting, we now end up under 301, where we have three lists that are currently ongoing. So we've got list one, which we talked about, and we'll talk about in a second, list two, and now we have list three. And with respect to list three, and again, we'll talk about in a second, um, it has now been proposed that that 10% additional tariff be increased to 25%. And for those of you who've been watching, there's been some um, uh, misinformation out there that that has already been implemented. That is being proposed. It has not been brought up yet, but certainly be watching that. Um, and, and we'll see how the administration ultimately uh, makes that determination. But when we look at list one specifically, let's take list by list. We look at list one specifically. That was announced on June 16, 2018. The U.S. imposed 25% tariff against imports from China. It went into effect as of July 6. Okay. We mentioned that imports are based on origin, not on country of export. This has become a question that we get every single day from, from clients or from folks internally within their organization. The, the tariff provisions are, there are 818 tariff provisions at issue. Um, they comprise 34 billion of the 50 billion that was originally identified. And they're predominantly, not all, but predominantly in, in the following chapters that we identified. So you're looking at chapters 84 through 88 um, and also chapter 90. So for those of you who fall into any of these chapters for tariff uh, classification purposes, obviously you're monitoring this really closely. So when the 301 process came down, similar to 232, you have uh, a product exclusion process which has put into play. So the requests for the product exclusions are being accepted for 301 at the product level, and they're being accepted until October 9th. 2018. So that's the date you need to circle around. If this list affects you, you need to circle on your calendar. Once once filed, the, the public will have 90 days to file. You have a 90-day request to file a, a product exclusion. Again, the period ends October 9th. 
The public can then respond. The public will have 14 days to file any responses to a product exclusion that's been filed. And then exclusions, if they are granted, are effective for one year upon publication of the exclusion. And what's important here is to understand is if you get a product exclusion underneath 301 for this purpose, that it will apply retroactively back to July 6, 2018, which is, is the implementation date that we've talked about. So let's look at list two. So when we look at list two, again, announced on June 15, 2018, it's the 25% tariff. Um, again, it's based on origin, not country of export. That's not changed. This is the 284 additional tariff provisions that were picked up. This is the remaining 16 billion of that 15 billion targeted. So where the 284 additional tariff provisions really targeted is they really honed in on a host of other items, but in particular, a wide range of items underneath Chapter 39. So for those of you, again, who are following along, if you're in Chapter 39, you need to be looking at this closely. There was a public comment hearing, which concluded on July 31st. And the final list that's going to ultimately come out is pending, and that is now uh, sitting with USTR for review. So turning to list three, so now we've got list one, list two, now we're going and looking at list three. So list three was announced on July 10th, 2018. This is the one that I think is, in, not to speak for everyone in the industry, but this is certainly more substantial and causing um, a greater heartache within within industry, but it consists of 6,031 eight-digit tariff provisions. This is the targeting of the 200 billion in additional Chinese imports. Again, based on origin, not export. We keep, we keep pounding that in to make sure people understand that differential. And as we mentioned, it was originally proposed at 10%, but USPR has now proposed to assess it at 25% instead. So for, again, for purposes of discussing with your internal folks and for purposes of planning, it's important to note that while the original imposition was looked at at 10, it is a possibility that that will be increased and assessed at 25%. So you need to bear that in mind when you're looking at your calculations for impact. And this webinar is timely because as of today, USPR published in the Federal Register revisions to the public comment period. So for those of you who are scrambling to try to get public comments in for purposes of this list, the comment period has now been extended. It was originally from August 17th. It has now been extended to September the 6th. The um, time period for requests to appear was also extended to August 13th. The public hearing schedule remains the same. That has not changed. That is from August 20th to the 23rd. And then the post-hearing comments and rebuttal period is being extended to September 6th as well. This is important that, that USTR publish this clarification because there were rumblings that there was going to be an extension, but that the extension would only be for purposes of the post-hearing rebuttal period. So again, this came out today um, in the Federal Register, so it is very timely. So you need to update accordingly if you are working internally to submit comments on, on this particular web. So when we look at impact to FTZs, and, and again, as we mentioned, there's a lot of information, so I'll try to move um, through this part quickly. But as with the other trade remedies, the proclamation that was handed down for purposes of 301 against China requires the designation of privileged foreign status. Okay, this is not different. This is the same. It's the same um, modus operandi that the, the administration is looking at. At the time of zone admission, again, on or after the effective date. And, but what's important about this is, unlike the 232 situation, merchandise admitted prior to the effective date in privileged foreign status is not subject. So there, you don't have a reach back provision here. But I caution that although you don't have the reach back, reach back position, in, in theory, you would think that the same, the same directive will apply to any further tariffs that are handed down by the administration. But obviously, this is something that needs to be very closely monitored so that there are no surprises that, that catch people off guard. So when we further look at the impact on FTZs, this slide is very important. Um, I'm certain people will have questions on this. And as, as Victoria mentioned, definitely send them in, and, and we'll be glad to respond to those. But even if you have this limitation, there's a greater risk here to zone users, and that concerns the origin requirement that's imposed under census reporting. Again, we've got another player that we need to look at where you have consequences that were not thought out. So 
for census reporting purposes, um, although CBP requires the origin to be identified on the entry summary based on the last country of transformation, census and CBP require where you have zones. Census and CBP requires through guidance, again, it's not law or regulation, that the origin of the zone manufactured goods be based on that country that provides the highest dollar value of foreign content. So note the, the third bullet point, presuming its legality, and there's some question regarding this, um, and right now we don't have any clarifying language in the applicable proclamations or in any federal register notices. This requirement would effectively serve to eliminate U.S. as an origin designation, okay? And what ends up happening is, depending upon the countries of sourcing that you have involved in your mix, it would introduce China and the 301 tariff to U.S. produced finished goods, okay? This is crucial. The NAFCZ I know has sent out um, e-blasts on this and, and wanting to understand people's manufacturing footprints, wanting to understand if people have paid attention to this, but that is very important. And similarly, it also introduces any foreign country of origin, and therefore then now you have the, the 201 situation that comes into play with respect to FTZ produced finished goods. And we're going to give an example um, in just a moment. I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca to give an example on this so you can kind of see where that comes into play. So, so looking at all of this, we've said a lot, and looking at all of this in summary, we've kind of given you a, a little bit of a cheat sheet. And again, you're looking at the specific trade action. Um, in the summary form, if you look at the next slide, it'll show the trade action, the current status, and the detail. So as you scroll down through this, make sure that you're building this out and you're continuing to monitor where these trade actions currently stand. Again, we mentioned keeping an eye on that group three under section 301 as to whether or not that's going to be moved from the 10% to the 25%. And certainly you, for your own purposes, can build this out within, within your organization for what's appropriate for you. And it's also important, just as a, another note, one of the other questions that we continually get is whether or not these tariffs are cumulative. They are, okay? So that's also something to make sure is communicated within your organization. So what actions has the NAFCD taken in response to this? So we wanted to just include a couple of slides, and, and I'll move through this quickly so Rebecca can, can really talk to the example. But it's important to understand for advocacy and educational efforts, in addition to everything else the NAFCZ has done with respect to ACE and all the participating government agencies, setting that aside, there have been a significant amount of effort. There's a multi-pronged strategy that's been approached. Um, we've identified some of the things that the NAFCZ has done here for you under education. Um, and that goes with the e-blast I mentioned. It's scheduling webinars and, and sessions at the spring conference, at the annual conference. It's contacting media to make sure that the information is out there on, first of all, what the, what the foreign trade zone program really is. There's been a lot of misinformation in the news. Um, the NEFTZ has worked very hard to try to make sure the program itself is understood, not just by folks in the media, but also by the administration, also on the Hill. Um, looking at advocacy efforts, I've listed those, so I won't go all through them, but um, it includes you know, letters at the highest echelons within the administration, and a significant amount of time of effort, time and effort spent lobbying on the Hill. And as part of this, and, and Rebecca will talk more about it, it's, it's making sure we have the input from our members because we want to be putting our best foot forward and making sure your concerns are, are heard as well. Because the more voices we have, it's, it's obviously going to rise, you know, rising tide lifts all ships, right? So that's, that's the idea that we're going for here. So this gives you an idea of the types of things that have been done. It's certainly not comprehensive, um, but I wanted to make sure that was out there. And now I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca because I think it's, it's important to illustrate an example of some of the adverse consequences that we're seeing, particularly from Section 301 perspective. So Rebecca, I'll turn that over to you. Great. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you for allowing me to kind of join your webinar at the last minute. Um, Along with the NAFTZ Executive Committee and the NAFTZ President, Eric Autor, and our General Counsel, Marshall Miller, I have been intimately involved in drafting uh, the written correspondence that we have sent to date to USTR and the Department of Commerce and CBP about this specific issue, and, and specifically I refer to the impact of the trade remedies on FTZ manufacturers. I've also been at the table um, with 
CBP at the commissioner's level, as well as with uh, our contacts at the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee, where we attempted to, in detail, explain this unintended negative impact to FTZ manufacturers and seek guidance to be issued so that um, the impact goes away, this negative impact, and it's clear for all parties how FTZ manufactured goods should be treated under the trade remedies. What we learned through all of you know, those correspondences and, and those meetings is really, we need to turn our attention at this point from an industry perspective, so not just NAFTZ as the trade association representing the industry, but the actual companies that are operating foreign trade zones to tell this message to our congressional representatives, as well as to continue to try to get to USTR. Um, because as Shannon pointed out, while right now the 232 on steel and aluminum has language contained in it that seems to provide a mechanism for not having that trade remedy duty impact applied to FTD manufactured goods, the 201 and the 301 do not. They don't contain that similar language and it really comes down to one sentence. And so the goal of all of us, not just NAFTZ, but of all the people on this call, whether you're a member of NAFTZ or not, is to put your story together in written format and share it with folks who will listen to you, specifically your congressional members. And hopefully combined, we can get to the right people at USTR so that they do understand that this is an unintended impact and it needs to be mitigated in a formal way. So in, in, in those efforts, we've, uh, we were kind of advised that the best way to do this is to give an example. And while this example is hypothetical in nature, um, the reality of this is not hypothetical. We know it's fact that companies are experiencing this impact. So we put together this example and hopefully, um, you know, we'll get other companies to join in and put their name on an example themselves so that the impact uh, resonates wider as time goes on. So this is kind of the content we put together and have introduced to anybody <laughs> who will look at it and listen. And basically what we're saying is um, a US company investing hundreds of millions of dollars to build a production facility in the United States employing potentially thousands of US workers to produce US finished goods should not be treated as if they are producing in and importing from a foreign country when imposing trade remedy duties. So for purposes of imposing these trade remedies, FTZ manufacturers should not be treated as if they are producing in and importing from a foreign country. This results in punishing a US manufacturer that is a member of the very domestic industry that these trade remedies are meant to protect. And so the way we demonstrate the impact is by highlighting four specific examples. Okay, and we're gonna focus on the 301. That's the big one, you know, the one specific to Chinese origin products. We have multiple lists, but this applies to the 201 as well. And so everybody needs to keep that in the back of their mind. Um, but for this particular scenario, we are going to show four uh, situations. It's a submersible water pump, okay? This classification happens to be on the first 301 list. And so we have a submersible water pump imported from China in finished form. So we have a finished good importation from Chinese origin. Now we have that same water pump imported from other than China. So other foreign origin countries coming into the United States. Then we have the, submer the same submersible water pump manufactured in the United States outside of an FTZ. Okay, so this is the non-FTZ example from both domestic and imported parts. And then the fourth example is we have that same pump being manufactured in the United States, this time under FTZ procedures in a foreign trade zone from the same domestic import and imported parts. So for purposes of example three and four, everything is exactly the same. The only difference is that the first company is not in a zone, so they import and clear at the port of arrival all of their parts and components and all of their duties, both normal and 301 duties, would be due at that time. The fourth example, those, those, that company obviously does not clear all of their parts and components at the port of arrival. They move them in bond for admission in their foreign trade zone in foreign status. So let's go through the examples quickly. And this gets a little, I mean, this is in the weeds. And so for folks on the phone who aren't in the weeds on FTV, it, it's probably going to be a little overwhelming. But you have the examples, so I'm not going to drill down into every detail. You can read through them 
and probably, you know, get your head around it um, after you take a, a few minutes uh, thinking about it. But if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them as part of the follow-up. So in the first example, that submersible water pump, it's imported from China. It's on the first list. It happens to be a duty-free import from a classification perspective. So from a normal or MSN, most favored nation duty rate, the duty applied is zero, but we have the punitive duties of 25% applied against the value of that $87 um, imported water pump. And so you see that the total duties due as a result of the section 301 are $21.75. That's imported in finished form from China. Next slide. We have that same water pump and it's not imported from China. So while the classification is on the list, its origin is not China, therefore the Section 301 does not apply. Um, it can be imported from any other country under the MSN duty rate of zero, which means it will come in duty free. Okay, so we have those two examples highlighting the difference between an a finished imported water pump coming from China under the 301 and then coming from other than China without the application of any duties whatsoever. In the next, next example, we have the US manufacturer who's making that water pump in the United States, but not under FTZ procedures. And they're using, of course, as I said, domestic and imported parts. And so we tried to list out all of the parts that they're using, right? And if you go through this, you'll see a couple of the parts um, are Chinese origin and they're on the section 301 list. In fact, the first one motors is on the first list so you'll see a 25% punitive duty. The other Chinese origin part that's on the 301 list is presumed to be on the third list, and so you'll see the 10% punitive duty. Now, whether that raises to 25% is to be determined, but for now, we'll use the 10%. The other parts and components that they're importing, and again, clearing at the port of arrival, are from um, either non-Chinese sources, you have Hong Kong, you have various non-China parts coming in, and then you also have a Chinese part but it's not on the 301 list, right? So it's not subject to the 301 remedy, um, but you'll note that it's $21 value happens to result in then that part um, being the foreign status part that has the highest value. So that's important to remember. We have a Chinese origin part, not on the 301, that derives the highest value of the zone manufactured good. Okay, so what's the impact? If you look at the other side, you see that we have a 301 duty impact of $5 for the motives, the motors, that's 25% against the $20 value, and 80 cents for the shaft couplings, that's 10% against the $8 value. And then, of course, we have the other duty liabilities, the MSN duties that the importer will pay when they clear it before they bring it to their manufacturing plant. And those duties total, you know, 50 cents, 10 cents, 22 cents and $1.18, resulting in a total duty impact for this, FT, this U.S. manufacturer not operating under FTZ procedures of $7.80, inclusive of 301 punitive duties and normal customs duties, MSN duties. Now let's turn it to the FTZ manufacturing situation. Same exact product sourcing, same exact product being made, except for now we're going to bring in the foreign the imported parts and components to the zone and bond and admit them in foreign status. Well, we know that because of the Section 301, any items that are on a list have to be admitted in PF status. That's a given, and it will result in, therefore, the application and payment of the subject duties uh, to those parts and components when the finished good gets removed from the foreign trade zone. So as a result of the 301 and the PF status requirement, you have an application of the $5 punitive duty on the motors, that's the $20 value at 25%, the 80 cent punitive duty on the shaft coupling, $8 at the 10% 301 duty, but then you're also going to uh, eliminate your inverted tariff benefit, right, because you've been uh, forced to admit those, those inputs in PF status. So you have an additional 72 cents in custom duties that will become liable, that you'll be liable for due to the fact that you were required to admit NPF status. Okay, so that's the impact of the 301 um, PF status duties and the MSN PF status duties. But then what we have, as Shannon alluded to, is the impact of the 301 duties on 
what's essentially all non-privileged foreign or NPS parts and components that are used to make the finished good classification. Because that um, flange, that Chinese origin flange that is not on the 301 list was admitted in NPS status properly and it, um, it itself drives the highest value for country of origin reporting requirement for the finished good. What you have is now a finished good that you've made in the foreign trade zone containing some PF status parts and components that will report on the customs entry as themselves and have the applicable 301 and, and MSI duties applied. And then you also have all of the value of the NPS materials properly admitted to the zone and made into a finished good whose value will report with a classification that is covered by the 301 and an origin, China, that is covered by the 301, resulting in the application of the 25% duties on that NPS value. And so if you look at how that all sums out, the FTV manufacturer, when you apply the 301 duty on the PF status parts and components, the MFN duty on the PF status parts and components, and then the 301 duty on the NPS status parts and components whose value was rolled up into a finished good, you have a duty liability of $16.27. And so the next slide really demonstrates that in a linear perspective, it shows you for the imported finished pump from China, $21.75 resulting from the 301 action. The imported pump from any other country comes in duty free, not made in the United States, but imported duty free. If you manufacture that pump in the foreign trade zone, you pay $16.27 in duties, and if you manufacture it outside of the FTZ, you would result in $7.80 uh, duty liability. And so really, this is meant to demonstrate and summarize on the next slide to uh, the administration and to Congress that U.S. manufacturers in an FTZ make goods in the United States they employ U.S. workers and they're adding domestic value just like any other U.S. manufacturer of the same product that's not performing those activities in an FTZ. Therefore, goods manufactured and substantially transformed into a different product in a U.S. FTZ should be treated the same as those non-FTZ U.S. manufacturers. And really, this is the crux. Goods manufactured and substantially transformed into a different product in U.S. foreign trade zones should not be treated as if that product is produced in and imported from a foreign country for purposes of application of the trade remedies. This is discriminatory treatment against FTV-made products. Um, it's a clear penalty, and it's going to further damage U.S. manufacturing if it's not resolved. And so on the next slide, what we basically provide to those interested in listening to us is the sentence that we think minimally needs to be added to both the 201 and the 301 um, that provides clarifying language to all parties that essentially goods manufactured, substantially transformed in a foreign trade zone should not be subject, should not have the additional trade remedy duties applied to essentially the value of those NPS materials properly admitted and manufactured into a different product. And so in summary, I know we're a little bit over. Um, the things that we need you to do, we want everybody to do, whether you're a member of NAFTV or not, is you really have to, if you're manufacturing under FTV procedures, you have to evaluate, you have to find a way to, to evaluate the potential impact of the 301 specifically on your zone manufactured goods. I've heard a couple of stories of folks caught off guard. Um, they did not realize the impact for zone manufactured goods. And so they found out the hard way, which is in the application of a lot of additional duties when they filed their first weekly entry summary. So please undertake that analysis. And if you are impacted, we strongly encourage you to engage and inform your executives now. Folks need to understand at the highest levels of your company what this impact is going to be or could be. Potentially submit comments in an exclusion request, especially since the deadlines have been extended in some cases. You have to develop and deploy a mitigation strategy um, prior to the effective date. We need you to contact your congressional representatives so they can hear the story. They need to know that folks within their districts have this impact so they can help us approach USTR. 
and we want everybody to provide their story to NAFTV. We are combining all the stories we receive. We already have a handful. We think the more voices we put to this, the more successful we'll be. And my last pitch is really, if you're not a member of NAFTV, we do a lot of work on behalf of this industry, and I strongly encourage you to join NAFTV. NAFTV, you'll, you'll find it to be a, an excellent resource um, for your FTV operations. So Shannon, I don't know if you wanted to pick it up from there or. Can we lose Shannon okay. again? I'll pick it up since we've got all these okay. NAFTZ events. We would love to have everyone join us. In addition to our monthly webinar series, we host four in-person events that are held in January, February, spring, and fall, with more details on our event page showcased here. First and foremost, thank you to our speakers, Shannon Fura and Rebecca Williams, as well as all of you for joining us today and making this webinar possible. All questions received will be provided in written form and shared with all registrants. For those seeking CCS, credit, respond to my follow-up email for attending the live event, and we'll be back in touch with you shortly. Lastly, please keep up your screen as a survey will immediately show upon the completion of this webinar. We look forward to your feedback and having you join us on future webinars and events.